Well, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, we'll be looking at verses 9 through 11. And before we dive into the text this morning, just to give you a high-level view of where we're headed in the coming weeks, um, we'll have a, a, a look at Paul's prayer for the church today. And um, next week, we will have another sermon. And then the following week, we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper. We'll consider the Lord's Supper from the Scriptures, celebrate it together. And then, Lord willing, the week after that, we'll start settling into the Gospel of Mark. So I share that with you, one, so you have kind of an idea of what should be coming, but then also so that you can uh, join me in praying that the Lord would really bless our times in his word, and especially as we get into the Gospel of Mark, that that would be uh, a study that just strengthens our love for the Lord Jesus as we walk through the Gospel, seeing him, and then also uh, one that helps us just grow in discipleship uh, together bit by bit. So Philippians 1, 9 through 11. Paul says, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Father, we pray that you would help us now as we look at your word. We thank you for the truths we just sung, that you keep us through the night, that you came to save us while we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And Lord, as we look at this prayer now, Paul's prayer for the church, Lord, would you help it to be our prayer for ourselves, for one another, and would you uh, do these things in our midst, even as Paul prayed you would do them in the Philippian, Philippian church. So help us now. Strengthen us, we pray, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, since I am new to the area, I was trying to educate myself a little this week, and I learned that uh, the production of cotton and sorghum uh, was one of the reasons that the port of Corpus Christi was originally created, developed, and uh, I read that Nueces County traditionally produces more grain sorghum than any other county in Texas. And I can safely say that before visiting in September, I don't think I'd ever heard of sorghum. So I'm, I'm gonna, I have a long ways to go. And um, I don't know a lot about growing cotton or sorghum, but I know that if you're going to plant a crop, you're going to put in a lot of work. And you're going to do it because you want a harvest. Imagine you have a promising plot of land, and you prepare the soil, you plant the seed at the proper time, you do whatever irrigation and uh, other things you need to do to maintain that crop, care for it as it grows. When harvest time comes, you want to see fields that are full of fruit or whatever crop you're producing. And that's one of the images Paul uses in this prayer when he talks about praying for a harvest of righteousness. And throughout the scripture, God uses the image of a vineyard uh, often to talk about his redemptive work with his people. And here, we, Paul gives us a picture. He, he prays that the church's love would overflow so they would produce a harvest of righteousness. And he give us this, gives us this picture of, of God the Father coming on the day of Jesus Christ and investigating and walking through the vineyard that he planted at Philippi through his son and looking for fruit and looking for a vineyard filled and bursting with fruit. This is what Paul was praying for and working for, for fruit-laden trees. And that's what we should be praying for and working for in our Christian lives individually and as a church. And Paul's prayer for the Philippian church nearly 2,000 years ago should be our prayer for River Hills Baptist Church. Paul's prayer here should shape us in several ways. It should shape us in how we pray and motivating us to pray these things. And also it should shape us in the kinds of things we're aiming for and that we value and the way, the way we think growth looks. So brothers and sisters, this morning as we look at this passage, we need to work 
and pray for an ever-increasing love that produces a harvest of righteousness for the glory of God. So first, we should ask God to increase our love because love is the heartbeat of the Christian life. The heart of this prayer is that love would abound. And love is vital. It is the heartbeat of the Christian life, the heartbeat of the church. You know, if you're checking vital signs, you're checking to make sure that the most basic functions of the body are working. And if we look at the function, most basic functions of the Christian life, you could say faith, hope, love. And the greatest of these is love. If you don't have a heartbeat, you're not going to live. If you don't have love, there's no Christian life. So this is not just a prayer for progress. Paul's not just praying, you know, I want you to go above and beyond. But it's also a prayer for perseverance and endurance. One of the greatest dangers is for a Christian's love to grow cold. Jesus warned that the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. In the epistles, we see Demas, one of Paul's companions, left him and abandoned Jesus because of his love. He was in love with the world, this present world, and offered, valued what the world offered him more than what Jesus and his kingdom offered. So I say it's vital for us to, for our love to grow, because I want us to realize that abounding in love, the kind of thing Paul's praying for here, it's not just a nice to have, it's not just an extra for like the really spiritual Christians. Paul's praying this for the whole church, for every Christian, that we all would abound in love. It's, it's foundational and essential to our continuation in the faith and our growth in looking more and more like Jesus. The greatest thing we can do is love God. The, the law is fulfilled in this, that we love God and love our neighbor as ourself, the scripture says. You could say, what is a Christian? One good answer is well, someone who loves God and loves their neighbor. The Apostle John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So love is vital to our Christian life. And before we go further, though, we should make sure we understand by what we mean by love. If we're going to ask God to increase our love, we need to understand what love is. And Paul helps us out in this letter and elsewhere in the scriptures. And we see first, love involves a warmth of affection. So just in the few verses before the ones we read, verses 1 through 8, we get a very clear picture of Paul's tenderhearted affection for the Philippian church. In verse 3, Paul says, He thanks God whenever he thinks of the Philippian church. In verses 4 and 5, he says he prays for them with joy because their faithful partnership in following Jesus. In verse 7, he says he holds the Philippian believers in his heart because they are partakers with him of the grace of God in his imprisonment and his defense and confirmation of the gospel. And then in verse 8, right before this prayer, he says, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul's clear affection for the Philippian Christians should shape our understanding of love. Love, true love, for the Lord Jesus, for one another, has a tender-hearted warmth to it, a warmth of affection. While love has a warmth of affection, love is not just a feeling. True love is not contentless. When Paul prays for their love to abound, he has things in mind. It's not just wants you to feel warm and fuzzy toward one another. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And in our day, it's popular to say things like, Love is love, and to insinuate that all loves are created equal. But that is false. There are disordered and diabolical loves. There are things that we should love and things that we shouldn't love. It's, it's to, to, to love Nazi ideology is not morally equivalent to loving Christianity. To love someone else's spouse is not morally equivalent to love for your own spouse. 
There are disordered loves, and there are proper loves. The only proper place for romantic sexual love is in the bounds of marriage between a man and a woman. God loves what is good and hates what is evil. Humans in rebellion against God love what is evil and hate what is good. Having affection and feelings for someone or something doesn't mean those affections and feelings are good. In fact, God tells us that each of us are born into this world with disordered loves, and each of us needs to humbly come before the Lord and ask him to give us new hearts, to love the things that he loves, to hate the things that he hates, and to have our affections continually shaped by his love and his word. So we see this in our passage this morning. When Paul prays that their love would abound, what's he going for? Look at verse 10. It's so that they would approve what is excellent. The result that Paul is praying for is that Christians would take a look at the life on this earth and all that the world has to offer, and they would approve the things that are superior. Love rejects what is evil. Love condemns what God condemns. Love approves what God approves. So love involves the warmth of affection. Love approves and rejoices in God and in his righteousness. And love obeys God. Paul prays for increased love so that, he says, so that they'll prove what is excellent, so that they'll be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. This is a love that bears fruit in good works. Like Paul says, it's faith uh, working itself out in love. Jesus simply states in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Rule keeping doesn't equal love. But if we love God, we will obey him. So in verse 8, Paul says he yearns for the Philippian believers with the affection of Christ. And it's the, it's the love of Christ, the affection of Christ, the compassionate, tender mercies of Jesus. They're the source of Paul's love for the Philippians and the source of our love for one another, the source of all Christian love. And not only is Jesus the source, but Paul gives us a beautiful description of Jesus' self-sacrificial, servant-hearted, humble, obedient love in the next chapter when he talks about how Jesus laid aside heaven's glories and took upon him the form of a servant and took upon him the form of a man and died. He was obedient to death, even death on the cross. So if we want to know what love is, we need to look at the Lord Jesus. And Paul makes that abundantly clear throughout this epistle. As John the Apostle says, this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So we should ask God to increase our love because love is the heartbeat of the Christian life. The greatest command is to love God and love our neighbor. God is love and he gives us the perfect display of love in his love toward us in Christ on the cross. Now, maybe you're here today and you hear that and you say, I don't know that I have love for God. I don't know that there's any warmth of affection in my heart for Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you treasure and obey his word? Do you actively seek to shape your affections after his heart? If you're here today and you don't have love for God, beware. Those who know God love him. Morality and church attendance will not make us children of God. And at the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. So if today you hear this and you see Paul's love and you say, I don't know that I have love for God. Today's the day to cry out to God for a heart of love. So we should ask God to increase our love because it's the heartbeat of the Christian life. And we also should ask God to increase our love because our love needs to grow in knowledge and discernment. So look at, at verse 9 where he says, um, I pray that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Now, is Paul, Paul simply asking for more love? Does he just want a greater quantity of love? He certainly wants more love. 
He says he wants uh, to increase, and this language of abounding, he, he paints this picture of it overflowing. So if you've got a river that's got its normal banks, and it's normally staying in those banks, he wants that love to come up into new territory. He wants that love to expand and to overflow, and he wants it to do so in knowledge and understanding. And we should note, as we read this, Paul is not writing this to a church that is loveless. He's not writing this to a church that has lost its first love or is just riddled with problems. He's writing to cherished partners in the gospel. He's writing a thank you letter for how they have supported him and sent gifts to him while he's in prison, how they have been a steadfast partner of his. So this is not a church that is low on love. And yet Paul's prayer for them is that their love would abound even more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Paul's prayer for ever-abounding love reminds us that love isn't stagnant. You know, consider this statement. Just, just think about this. Someone says, when I married my wife, I loved her. It doesn't, doesn't sound good out of context. If a husband or wife doesn't actively work to maintain and strengthen and grow their love, that love can dwindle and die. And if we don't actively work to strengthen and maintain and stir one another up in love, that love can dwindle and die. It doesn't help us, it doesn't help me if my heart used to beat. You know, I used to have a heartbeat. Uh, I need my heart to keep beating right now. And it doesn't help me if I used to love. I need to ever abound in love if I'm to follow Jesus. If we're not actively working to maintain our love, to grow in our love, our love will grow cold. So Paul's prayer for ever abounding love reminds us love isn't stagnant. It also reminds us that we're not going to reach the height of love this side of eternity. The triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is an inexhaustible fountain of love. And as we seek in our love to him, to know him and grow to be like him, we, like Paul, will ever need to be growing so that we can grasp the height and breadth and length and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So as Christians, we constantly want to be growing in love because we want to be more and more like God, and we're never going to exhaust his love. So Paul certainly wants an increase in the quantity of love, but that's not just what he's praying for. He wants it to grow with knowledge and all discernment. So what does it mean for love to grow with respect to knowledge and all discernment? For one, it tells us that if we think love is all we need, we're going to have an impoverished love. Our love actually won't be what it should be. Imagine that someone you love is seriously injured. If you don't have the medical knowledge and discernment to know how to move in in a way that helps them, you could, have, you could love them more than anyone in the world and not be equipped to, to do what they need. So it's the doctor who's trained and equipped and has the knowledge and discernment who can actually move into that situation and help that person. Our love grows through our knowledge of God, both our relational knowledge of just walking with the Lord Jesus faithfully day in and day out, and also our knowledge of the scriptures, our knowledge of his word and his ways. Did you know that your participation in corporate worship, your pursuit of the Lord in private prayer, your personal study of the scriptures plays a crucial role in strengthening your love for God and for the saints and for your neighbor? The more we know God and his word, the more our love can overflow. But it's not just a knowledge of God that we need. We also need increased knowledge of others, of one another, of our neighbors, to know how to best meet their needs with the love of Christ. The more we know someone, the better equipped we are to serve them, to encourage them, to exhort them, to rebuke them in a way that's fitting to their personality, to their circumstances, to their situation. Knowledge alone puffs up. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 8. But here, knowledge is working as a servant of love to strengthen our love, to further our love. We should be students of the scriptures and we should be students of one another so that our love can increase and overflow. The focus, when he says, uh, he says knowledge, but then he also says discernment. Or as another translation says, that your love would grow in every kind of insight. 
And the focus there is on understanding what's fitting, what's appropriate. The author of Hebrews writes, solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. There's a, a lot of things that we can only learn by practicing, by working our way through. I was thinking of this as I watched our oldest two kiddos try to crack an egg and put it in the bowl for breakfast. You know, maybe, maybe they hit it so soft it doesn't do anything. Or it's so hard it is on the floor, on me. And it, it takes some discernment, some ability to know how hard do I need to hit this thing to get it in the bowl and not everywhere else. And spiritually, we have to practice and exercise our spiritual senses, our love, so that our love can have the right kind of discernment to know what's fitting here, what's appropriate. You know, I, I used the statement earlier, I love my wife when I married her. That's true, I still love her. Um, but my love for my wife has had a lot of room to grow in knowledge and discernment over eight and a half years. You can love Jesus when you first follow him, but there's so much room for our love to grow in knowledge and discernment as we grow better to know what that means. And same for one another. Brothers and sisters, let's say you know, we know one another. This, this applies to us. Let's say we know one another well. Praise the Lord. If you know one another for 10, 15, five, whatever it is, years, that's not just some kind of stockpile of information. That's information that you can actively use to think, how can I love this brother, this sister? How can I move into their life in a way that blesses them? Because you know them. You're better equipped to do that. So brothers and sisters, where does your love need to grow with knowledge and discernment? Husbands, God commands us to live with our wives in an understanding way. Do you seek to actively grow in understanding your wife so you can better serve and strengthen and love her? Wives, your love for your husband can grow through knowledge of what respect and biblical submission looks like for a wife in marriage. Fathers, we're commanded to not provoke our children to anger. If we're going to obey that command, we need to know our kids and know what's going to be a wise way to instruct and train our children so that we're not provoking them to anger while we do raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the more we get to know one another, the better equipped we are to love one another. Your personal relationship with a brother or sister in the church may mean that you're actually best positioned to be the one to speak the truth into their life in a way that no one else is because you know them and they know you. Christians, we love our unbelieving friends, our unbelieving neighbors, our unbelieving family, our unbelieving coworkers. But we need wisdom, we need knowledge and discernment to know when is it fitting to bring up this conversation? How do I assess their spiritual condition? How do I love them? How do I love people who are different from me? How do I love people who are in different socioeconomic classes? How do I love people who have different personalities and are maybe harder to get along with? We need our love. We might love them, but we need our love to grow in knowledge and discernment so we know how to navigate relationships with one another in a way that builds each other up and strengthens each other. We should ask God to increase our love because love is vital to our Christian life. We need our love to grow in knowledge and discernment. And we should also ask God to increase our love because only God can bring this growth. We should as we look at this passage, certainly glean from it ways that we grow as Christians. But we shouldn't forget this is a prayer that Paul was praying. Paul gives lots of exhortations in this epistle that align with this prayer. But before Paul speaks to the church directly, one commentator notes, before he speaks to the church directly, he speaks to God about the church. And like Paul, we need to be careful that we don't skip over first things first. When Paul describes, what Paul describes in this prayer will never happen if God doesn't do it. We can create formulas for our own personal growth, for growth as a church, but we'll never actually grow unless the Lord builds the house. 
Unless he builds the house, they labor in vain who do it. So let us join with the Apostle Paul in putting first things first, in follow his example and ask the Lord to increase our love. Beseech the Lord to increase your love. Ask him to strengthen the love of your brothers and sisters in this church. Ask him to strengthen our love as a church so that we'll grow with knowledge and all discernment. And this challenges us to ask, what are the types of things that fill our prayers? What are the types of requests that we are taking before the Lord? It's good for us to pray for our daily bread, our physical needs. Jesus taught us to do that. But that shouldn't be the only thing that fills our prayers. Do you pray for the things that Paul prays for here? Do you regularly ask the Lord to increase your love so that you will grow in holiness for the glory of God? Do you yearn for a harvest of righteousness in your life? And not just for you individually, but do you pray for your brothers and sisters in this church? These things. Do we long to see an ever-increasing discernment in love among one another? And do you see, brother, sister, that the fruit of your life is simply one part of that harvest that Paul's praying for in the church? So let's join together in regularly asking God to increase our love. Let's also work and pray to do the things we see in this prayer. So look next, as Paul says, he wants their love to increase in knowledge and understanding so that, what's the result he's going for? So that they would approve what is excellent, what is worth more than other things, what is superior to the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the boasting in life, as the Apostle John talks about. Paul describes a growth in love that shapes our values, a growth in love that redefines our priorities, prayer that informs an understanding of what love is. We may say we love God very much. We may even feel a warmth of affection toward him. But Paul tests love by its fruit. True love bears fruit in godliness. So that's what Paul is, is praying for here. When the word translated excellent here in the ESV, uh, and others is translated superior, or in one, what is best. And it has this idea of things that stand above. And we might think that, okay, Paul's saying he wants me to approve what's superior. We could be thinking of like, it's all this... Um, you know, we're not thinking black and white. It's all up here in the, like, better, best kind of categories. But Paul gives us many examples of what he means when he talks about what is superior in this letter. In just a few verses, he says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He's talking about what is superior. His love for Jesus takes priority in his life. He considers following Jesus the most important thing he can do in his life. And what's more, he sees his death as gain because he's valuing seeing Jesus and being with Jesus as more than anything that life could offer. In fact, he says in verse 23 of chapter 1, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So Paul's mature love for Christ means that Paul values knowing Christ and being with Christ over all that death could take away. It's better to be with Jesus. And as you read through the epistle to the Philippians, you'll see other examples of things that are superior. In chapter 2, Paul exhorts us to think the way Jesus thought and consider others more important than ourselves. Humble, servant-hearted, obedience to God is superior to proud, self-serving autonomy. In chapter 2, he also goes on to say, do all things without grumbling or complaining, disputing. Another example of approving what is superior. We may think we deserve better circumstances in our lives, but Paul gives us this command so that we'll shine like lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, because he's saying we should approve God's wise ordering of our circumstances 
and see that as superior to our own understanding of how life should go. So Paul prays for the saints that they would approve what is superior, and that looks like, in this instance, doing all things without grumbling or complaining. And then in Philippians 3, Paul provides uh, an unmistakable testimony of what is superior when he says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So Paul gives us clear examples of what it means to approve what is superior. And it's not just some vague stuff up there, but it's like those who have been raised with Jesus, seeking the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And as our love overflows in knowledge and discernment, we will continually grow in rejecting the things of this world and approving the things of God. So if our aim is to approve what is superior, to prove what is excellent, rather than going through life asking, is this sinful? Can I do it? We should be asking, is this Christ-like? Will this make me more like Jesus? Our love for God and love for neighbor grows in knowledge and discernment, and as that happens, we will grow in Christ-likeness. Rather than just aiming to avoid sin, we'll be aiming to produce a harvest of righteousness for the glory of God. Approving what is superior means prioritizing communion with God in prayer and the scriptures over the demands of business and leisure. Approving what is superior means disciplining ourselves to pray more than what to, to, put, to put our time in prayer, take that time more than what we think we could produce with our own efforts with that time. Approving what is superior means proactively working to redeem the time rather than spending hours watching YouTube videos. Approving what is superior means guarding ourselves from entertainment that's riddled with sex and nudity and things that will bring the wrath of God and instead approving the things that are excellent. Approving what is superior means dressing with dignity and modesty rather than preferring trendy clothing that dishonors God. Approving what is superior means spending time praying for others, more time praying for others, than arguing with them about theology. It is noble and Christ-like to approve what is superior. Brothers and sisters, and particularly our youth and our young people, do you tend to ask, is this sinful? Or do you tend to ask, is this Christ-like? Does this is this going to help me grow in loving Jesus? At the end of this epistle, Paul writes, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So ask God to increase your love and knowledge and discernment. Approve what is excellent, what is superior. And finally, brothers and sisters, pursue holiness for the glory of God. Where is Paul's prayer headed? It flows out of his love, out of the affection of Christ Jesus. It starts with asking for more love. It goes to holiness, be pure and blameless. But it's all headed to the glory of God. God receiving the honor that is due his name. God receiving worship, what he is truly uh, deserving of receiving. Your holiness individually and our holiness as a church will result in glory and praise to our God. Both physical crops and spiritual fruit require human and divine work. The crops won't plant themselves. The farmer needs to prepare the soil, plant the seeds, water the ground. Even then, those crops won't grow if the Lord doesn't cause the sun to rise, send the rain, 
and, co- and give the growth. And Christian, in the same way, you and I need to diligently pursue spiritual fruit. Jesus died and rose again to give us new life. In the next chapter, Paul says, God's working in us to will and to do his good pleasure and instructs us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We should join Paul in asking God to grow our love, and we should diligently work to grow our love, to have the mind of Christ, as he says in the next chapter. So Christian, are you striving for growth in godliness? I mean, imagine a farmer who just neglected his fields. He didn't plant, he didn't prepare, he didn't fertilize, he just sat on his front porch and just watched it all. He's not going to have anything growing that's worth getting. But we unwittingly can do this in our spiritual life. We're tempted to think that we will produce a harvest of righteousness without disciplining ourselves to pray. We're tempted to think we'll become more like Jesus without consistently meditating on the scriptures. We can fall prey to the temptation to think that our spiritual growth is someone else's responsibility or that our spouse or our children, they're going to produce fruit as long as they're just exposed to the right things. And we can unwittingly neglect diligently, prayerfully cultivating spiritual fruit in our family and in our church. So brothers and sisters, there's no spiritual growth apart from spiritual work. God alone gives the growth, and he consistently calls us to labor in his field and work for a harvest of righteousness. Jesus said in the passage that Joel read earlier, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Now how does our spiritual growth, our growth in godliness, how does that glorify God? Well, Paul says it's the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Everything good in our lives comes because of Jesus' work. The fruit of righteousness only comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. So every good bit of fruit that's produced in our life, every good bit of holiness or godliness or love or joy or peace or long-suffering— Well, that's all because of Jesus and because of his work. As Paul says elsewhere, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So why should we want to produce a harvest of righteousness? Because we want to honor God. We want people to praise God. We want the triune God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be exalted and worshipped and praised as he should be. And when people who bear the name of Jesus don't act in a Christ-like way, we dishonor the name of Jesus. When those who call God Father don't imitate their Heavenly Father, we dishonor our Father. But as Christians, we want to produce a harvest of righteousness because we want to honor our Father. So this phrase at the end, to the glory and praise of God, it's not just a theological tack on, just some theological mumbo jumbo. It's actually crucial. Because let's say we have a life that looks very moral. But it's not for the glory of God. It's not because we worship Jesus Christ. If that's the case, we'll stand condemned as idolaters. Our righteousness is unrighteousness, if it isn't for the glory of God, if it isn't in worship to the one true and living God. And you may be here today and consider yourself a very good person. In fact, maybe you stand out as someone who does things right, has strong morals, has conservative principles. But I need to warn you, if your morality is disconnected from the God of the universe, then you don't know God. If you do the right thing because you want to be respectable or because you want people to think well of you, then you're in grave spiritual danger. If you do good without worshiping God, your goodness is self-serving and idolatrous. There was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He was an incredibly moral man. 
He kept all the commandments. And he says, Jesus, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, well, there's one thing you're missing. You need to sell your possessions and come follow me. Not because there's a universal command to sell all your possessions, but because this man was so in love with his money that he would not follow Jesus if it cost him that. He was very moral, but he would not worship the living God. Perhaps you're here today and you don't know what it means to worship and glorify God. My friend, the God of the universe created us to worship him and to enjoy him forever. He created us to flourish under the warmth of his love. But the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, rejected God's word, rebelled against his rule. And now every single one of us who are born into this world come in as enemies of God and rebels. Every one of us has broken God's law. We've lied, we've stolen, we've lusted, we've coveted, we've hated. Because of our sin against God, we deserve to be punished forever. But God, in his great mercy, sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived a perfectly righteous life, who died on the cross, though he did not have any sin of his own. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for sinners so that everyone who puts their trust in him, the risen Lord Jesus, can have eternal life and forgiveness of their sins. So when we talk about honoring and glorifying God and worshiping him, we're talking about giving this God who created us and owns us and then who redeemed us at the cost of his son's blood, giving him the worship that is due his name. And now God commands everyone, every man and woman, every boy and girl, to turn from their rebellion and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with the promise that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved from God's judgment and become God's child to enjoy eternal pleasures in God's presence forever. So if you're here today and you haven't turned from your sins and trusted in the Lord Jesus, then don't leave today without calling on the name of the Lord for mercy. Come down front after the service and, or ask someone sitting next to you about this good news. We want to open the scriptures and explain to you how you can have your sins forgiven and be reconciled with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, let's follow, follow Paul's example. Let's join one another and our brother Paul in asking the Lord to evermore increase our love more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that we may abound in a love that, that has produces a harvest of righteousness, approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. On the last day when the, when the Father inspects his vineyard, may he find it bursting with good fruit, with a fruit of righteousness. And I'll just say a final word as, as we think of this. We can pray this prayer, and we can work toward these things with so much confidence. Because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you know what Paul says just a few verses either, earlier. He says, I'm convinced that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul goes from that to pray for it to happen. He has confidence. This is God's will for us. He's going to do it. So we can pray and we can work with that confidence. So may the Lord continue to produce in us a harvest of righteousness here at River Hills Baptist Church for his glory and our joy. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you, out of the overflow of your love, your tender affection for us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you for that. Lord, we pray that we, your people, those who trust in you, would have an ever-abounding love for you and for one another. Lord, would you do the work of this prayer in our midst at River Hills Baptist Church? Would you make us a people who have an ever-increasing love with knowledge and discernment and a harvest of righteousness that truly brings great praise and great glory to you, the one true and living God? We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.